We need $135,000 for the purchase price. The place is not even worth $120,000 that we're giving you. How is it worth $135,000? We got our BPO, it's worth $135,000. And if you guys want to move forward, you need to raise the price. So we go back to the buyer. The buyer says, we're pushing it at $120,000. I'll go up to $121,000, but that's it. Okay, we go back to the bank. We'll remain nameless, although there's probably a branch on the street there. <laughs> uh, oh, one of the big ones that... Uh, Red, white, and blue, by any chance? No, they're my favorite. Oh, good. They're my favorite. <laughs> just, just the blue and black. <laughs> uh, so, forget it. Not 135, the deal's dead. Well, it's been a couple months now. My client's very frustrated as a seller. She says... Forget it. I don't want to deal with the bank anymore. This, I don't want to do the short sale. I just want to give them the property back. There's a process called a deed in lieu of foreclosure, where instead of going through the whole foreclosure process, you basically negotiate with the bank, give them the property, and you walk away. My client's like, that's what I want to do. Please help me with it. Do they do deficiency judgments in those? Typically not. Okay. Uh, so they agreed to do, we, we decide we're going to do this. Client says, I want you to work on it. Says, Fine, I don't care, whatever you want me to do. So we go and we resubmit all the paperwork to a different department. And of course, they lose it three times, but they eventually find everything. <laughs> I get a call from the negotiator. Okay, everything looks good on the deed and loop. We had an appraisal done, and the appraisal came in at 52000 <laughs> I said, fantastic. All right. I go, you do understand that I had a contract last month for you to give you 120000 She starts laughing. I go, obviously, this isn't the first time you heard it. She goes, no. I go, okay. I go, well, let's say we want to stop the deed in lieu and go back and do a short sale. I go, your 52 is good, right? She goes, yeah, that's what's in our books. 52 is what we have. That's what the place is worth. I said, fantastic. I go, we're going to get a new contract. She goes, great. I'll close it out. You start again. So we start again with the bank on the short sale side. We go to the buyer. Without telling them about the 52, we say, you know what? We'll try this again. Give us your best offer. They come in at 79,000. Wow, 79,000. We got an appraisal at 52. Buyer's in at 79. Buyer's thrilled, right? The buyer all of a sudden is saving $40,000 on what they were gonna pay two months earlier. 79,000, fantastic. We submit everything to the bank. We go through the process. They do their BPO again. We get a call from the negotiator. Okay, we have a problem with the price. We need 120000 ah, Wait a second. You just did an appraisal at fifty two. Yeah, it's now worth 120. So now we're negotiating with the bank, unnamed, and if the investor, who's Fannie Mae, they have a disagreement on price. So I'm now negotiating and fighting with Fannie Mae and with the bank, trying to get them to agree to our 79000 in fact, this deal has two loans, first and the second. The second negotiator thinks the first negotiator is nuts, and he's trying to get his supervisors involved to push this thing through. But it's been probably close to a year since we started this, and our buyer's ready to walk. So the bank, again, the unnamed bank, instead of taking the 120, which was on the table, which is not what they want six months ago, is probably going to wind up with nothing. Because I can't really vouch for my client here, but I assume if this deal falls apart, she will not do another short sale. She will not do a deed in lieu. She will let the property go into foreclosure. And when the bank shows up to take the property back, they will be very surprised at what is no longer in the property. And it's going to cost the bank a fortune fix things up if that's the way it goes. And they're ultimately going to sell this thing for maybe 30000 and they're going to hold it for the next three to four years. So when you guys are saying, why would a bank act the way they do? If you can explain that scenario, then you can understand why the banks do what they do. Okay? How, did, um, how, how did short sales even start? What was Whose idea was it? The bank's idea? The real estate agent? Uh... That's a good question. Um, years ago, short sales used to exist, but they weren't as elaborate as they are now. What would happen is you had a seller who was selling, 
and was short. So typically what happened is they brought money to closing. Yeah. And if there were times where they didn't have enough money to come to closing, we would be on the phone as the attorneys, and we would be negotiating with some vice president of the bank and saying, look, my client's going to walk away. My client, you want this foreclosure? You're not in the business of selling properties. That used to work when banks actually were scared of foreclosures. Uh, and you would be able to kind of negotiate a price. You know, maybe the seller had to bring some money to the closing. Maybe you did some other stuff. But it was a lot more streamlined because you were dealing with, you know, a, a smaller bank, a loan committee or a VP or somebody that had a little more uh, pull. Now you're ultimately dealing with an asset manager of some investor in New York City who knows nothing about price and is looking at a spreadsheet and knows that he's got to meet certain numbers or he's not going to get his bonus or he's going to get fired or whatever. So what happened was when the market tanked and price values went down, this kind of got resurrected from the, this thing that nobody was doing to all of a sudden the banks were flooded with these, re, these requests. And initially they were saying, no, they weren't going to do them. Then they realized how much was out there. And so they slowly started developing you know, short sale teams, short sale departments, forms and stuff. And then once that started going, the good old federal government got involved and started creating federal programs to streamline the process, which has done nothing to streamline the process. I'm sure that shocks all of you to hear. Um, so that's kind of how they you know, developed over time. So today, do you know, um, do they add PMI now to, if, if as an investor, if we buy an income property? If you're... Are they going to put a PMI on there whether you like it or not? If you're putting less than 20% down, typically. Oh, okay. Yes. So otherwise... Or on a condo, it's 25%. 25 and, and there's different rules because, yeah, on, on an investment, they, they may have a higher requirement. And, you know, there's still different loan, loan value types and whatnot but it comes down primarily to the Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac guidelines, which are constantly changing now because they see how they keep losing money. Yeah. Um, I need to back up here again. Sure. As a buyer. Yes. How do you know you're about to enter and walk down the short sale path? Because I'm, I'm concerned that, you know, you might have gone out looking and contacted agents and you're about to start making offers. At what point do you know you're really dealing with a short sale? Well, an honest person will tell you in the MLS, they'll say it's a short sale. Okay. Uh, if they don't, Bert has some ways of finding out, which we won't share with you because that's a little secret. I have some ways. I can use my legal magic wand. We, we can get an idea by looking at what the mortgages are on the property versus what they're paying for. Now, we don't know what the current value of the mortgage, but we can see if they have a mortgage for $400,000 that they took out two years ago, and they're selling the property for $200,000 right now, it's a short sale. Now, do they have the two hundred dollars to come to the closing? Maybe. My guess is most cases probably not. Um, that's kind of how you know. Most people will tell you, and the reason being, nobody wants to do this work if they're not going to get somewhere in the end. Okay. I have a special rider that I created out of using a dozen different short sale riders out there that I'm pretty insistent on using as a seller. I don't mind it as a buyer either, but I like to tell people up front, look, we're going to put a lot of time into this thing. You're going to have to do your inspection up front. You're going to have to start working on your mortgage. You're going to have to take it on faith that we're going to get this thing done.